Hi, I'm Jonathan Lehman, Editorial Director at Nine Marks. Welcome to Journal Talk. Journal Talk is where we talk about the most recent Nine Marks journal. And this last one was on heaven. And my good friend, Ryan Fullerton, Senior Pastor at Emanuel Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky, wrote an article called Preaching Heaven to Help Your People Fight Materialism. And in that article, Ryan, you quote Jesus talking about the seed that's thrown among the thorns and eventually the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. Apparently, this isn't just an American problem of materialism. Is that right? No, I have the privilege of serving with a Cameroonian co-pastor, and he's continually reminding me that... Uh, well, the reason the health and wealth gospel has made such inroads into Africa, of course, is because the desire for riches is a perennial problem. It's a human heart problem. And so wherever you find people, you're going to find uh, materialism. Some people are uh, frustrated materialists and some people are satisfied materialists, but really all over the world, people are materialists. So different cultures treasure different things, but our hearts are all tempted to treasure the world, whether it's the stock market or more cows or whatever the case may be, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, as you're talking about preaching heaven to fight materialism, isn't there a risk of too much of a, hey, don't care about this world, it's all going to burn? just look forward to having people. Is, is that a risk? Uh, I, I, I suppose it's a risk, but uh, I think it depends what kind of heaven you're speaking about. The kind of heaven I'm talking about is a lot like earth, except without sin. And so you're talking about a very material heaven, one with roads and meat and cheese and wine and, uh, and all of the good things of this world. And Colossians tells us that as the gospel opens up the hope of heaven, that it actually moved the Colossians to love. So hmm. there's something about knowing that all of your needs are going to be met, all of your desires for beauty, glory, fellowship with God, all of that going to be met actually frees you up down here so that you can give more of what you have away. And I think that's one of the, that's the way in which it's sort of a, an expulsive affection, if you will, if you could kind of riff on right. Chalmers for a minute. Yeah, right. Okay, so you're already beginning to answer the question, but just let me ask it in a more straightforward fashion. How do you preach heaven? How do we preach heaven to fight materialism? Well, I think there's a number of ways. I mean, one is just preaching heaven. That's not done very often. So I think we want to make sure that we're actually expounding heaven and getting caught up in the glories of it. I think we want to preach a heaven that is very physical, because otherwise, I find when I talk to Christians that they just have no idea what heaven's going to be like. There's sort of a sense of fellowship with Jesus will be great, but there's sort of no sense of what heaven will be like. And that, that sense of not being able to explain or understand what heaven will be like does, I think, rob heaven of some of its motivating power. And when we understand that heaven is a lot like earth, but without sin, uh, that, it's, that it's full of all the creation glories that God gives. God will glorify himself most in the new heavens and the new earth, just like he declares his glory in this heaven and this earth. And he'll do it all with unbroken fellowship with Jesus. I think that gives people something to realize, well, I have an actual hope. It's a hope I can understand. And it's a hope I can really look forward to. And so I can give up uh, material treasures here, knowing that I'm going to get them there. I think, I think that's a big piece of it. I also think understanding that heaven is a storehouse, that we're to store up treasures in heaven. And we have to explain be careful that. here. Go ahead. Explain, explain yeah. that. Well, I think we have to, I, my understanding of rewards is they, they really are treasures. And what do treasures do here on earth? Well, treasures open up opportunities for more pleasures. You know, so when I have more money, I can get more things. I can make use of more of the resources of this world to my enjoyment. And as God gives me treasures in heaven, I'm going to have access to, let's say, governing more cities or enjoying more meat, more cheese. And, uh, and of course, none of this will be distraction from Christ like it so often is here in this world, where as the verse you quoted, it can choke out our fellowship with Christ. There, everything will just redound to his glory. I think one thing you have to be careful with there is, so what do I do if I get more treasures than the next guy? Will we both be equally able to enjoy heaven? And I think we will. And one of the ways I like to illustrate this is I, I'm a pathetic aspiring banjo player. I think I have four chords under my belt. 
and I'm forever uh, wanting to play banjo better. And I really like banjo music. And there are people like Abela Fleck or just people who play well, who can enjoy banjo a lot more, but we, we both thoroughly enjoy the banjo. But because of their acquisition of skills and talents, they enjoy it more, but we both have fullness of joy in that sense. I think that's a way of reconciling the idea of treasures. How can one Christian get more treasure than another and yet every Christian be satisfied? I think it's something along those lines. And so I think we want to preach a heaven where we can lay up store, we can lay up treasures in heaven, and those treasures will really contribute to our eternal joy. I've, I've, I've thought of, of so, a similar illustration, like li listening to a Beethoven symphony. I, I can enjoy it at one level. Somebody who's actually tried to compose a symphony right. can enjoy it at another level. Right. And it's almost insofar as we have the first shall be last and the last shall be first. My, my guess is in many ways, those who have suffered most in this world are like the composers who are like, yes, this, this is righteousness. This is justice. And, 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 and be thrilled with it in ways that those of us who have not suffered as much. It'll be yeah, the only thing I would the only thing I would throw in there, I think that's I think that's right. I guess part of what I'm trying to get out of my article, and this this may be an American angle to the article, is that I do think there has been sort of uh, some rich bashing that's gone on in the evangelical church for quite a while now, and and that's a sense in which <clears throat> uh, the rich are almost uh, destined to a substandard spirituality. Sometimes the way the same way singles are made to feel in the church, they're they're basically doomed to have this uh, perennial uh, spiritual danger in their lives. And, and yet, uh, Paul is fascinating in that he doesn't take the approach that so many uh, preachers do in our day. He tells the rich that God has given them all things richly to enjoy here on earth. So he says, you know, enjoy that. Obviously, he's not talking about being consumed with it, not being willing to not sacrifice it. But he is saying, enjoy those riches you have. And you have a double responsibility, it seems, to lay up treasures in heaven, to uh, be rich in good deeds. And so I think we really want to open up a spirituality where rich and poor both have an equal opportunity to use what they have or don't have to fellowship with God, Amen. both here on earth and in, the, and in the world to come. Well said, well said. Now, I've noticed in this conversation, you've mentioned meat and cheese twice. Is this a big thing with you? You're a big it's, cheese it's a big, it's a, Meat and cheese is a big thing with me. And it started, I don't know if it started because I like meat and cheese or if it started because Isaiah 25, he's the one who's <laughs> always going on about the, the well-aged wine and the, and the meat and the cheese. So one of the things that I, frustrates me a touch is that we have such earthy descriptions of heaven in the, in Bible. the Bible, and then we get such uh, sort of ethereal descriptions of heaven from the pulpit. And I think, I think we really want to have concrete illustrations of heaven. Of course, there's an element to heaven which we just cannot understand, do not yeah. know. And yet, yeah. I, I love the end of Narnia, where, of course, they're arriving in the new Narnia, and they find that it was just like the old Narnia had always been supposed to have been. It, it was sort of the fulfillment of all that Narnia yeah. was ever meant to be. It was Narnia only better. And I, I just think of, you know, everything, every time we've ever enjoyed a waterfall here on this earth, we know we have to leave or we have a backache while we enjoy it, but, or we're not having great communion with God that day. In heaven, all of that's gone. Your back feels great. You can stay at the water indefinitely, waterfall indefinitely, and uh, your fellowship with Jesus and enjoying the waterfall is full and complete. And you're just praising him for all of his majestic works. Amen. I, Friends, yeah, the article think, is preaching heaven to help. The, the article is preaching heaven to help your people fight materialism. It's fantastic. I'd encourage you to take a look at it in the Heaven Journal at the nine at ninemarks.org. Thanks for your time, brother. Thanks, Jonathan.